Konisti Howie. Welcome to the Candle Tales podcast. My name is Aaron and I'm gonna talk about some stories. Uh, welcome to a an extra podcast. I guess we're releasing more content at the moment as what with the whole lockdown and being locked down. Not the usual type of locked for us Irish, I suppose. But um sorry, bad stereotype there. I'm sitting in the office where I do all these podcasts with my sister Surika, the other uh, co-founder of Candle Tales. We've been telling stories for the last five years or so, playing with musicians. Other one of the main first members, Ru O'Shea, brought music along with it, and we've been playing music and telling stories for a long time now. And it's a privilege to be able to tell Irish stories and retell them and reimagine them and re create them with live audiences unfortunately our live shows are on hiatus along with you know everything else to do with group gatherings that's all right we've got a bit of focus for these live uh sorry uh recording of podcasts i should say we have uh, loads of stuff recorded from live shows and we're just going to start trickling stuff out now. So, Rue O'Shea, as I mentioned, brought the music to Candle Tales geez, five years ago, over five years ago, in the Stag's Head in one of our first gigs and it took him a while, but eventually he started telling stories as well. He was a bit reluctant for a while, but... um. Anyway, he's going to tell a story, one that Surika has told in this podcast before, but one that we, we do enjoy going back to again and again. And without too much uh, waffle as his intro, he's going to tell the story of Medir and Atain. If you do like these these podcasts, well, I hope you're enjoying them. I hope you can share them with someone and I hope you can maybe retell some of these stories. First and foremost, I love to hear people listening to it at all. So thank you very much. If you want to support us doing these podcasts and doing more of them and getting getting more content out there well you can go to patreon.com forward slash candle tales to help support the creation of music and storytelling irish culture and heritage that we try and create for well for the sake of creating it i suppose without further ado here is a story recorded at our live show for the love of gods last month in february in Whelan's upstairs and the storyteller was Rue O'Shea with Audrey Trainer and Alan Homan. Enjoy. The next story starts with the god of love himself in the time of the two and eight Danon before the Celts came to Ireland. And it starts with the birth story of the god of love, Angus Oak. I can't tell you that in its entirety right now because Aaron's probably going to tell you that story at the end of the show. If we have time. Suffice to say, a god called the Dagda and a goddess called Boan. He, he, he showed Boan his trick and stick, and she liked the trick that it did. And they ended up with a secret love baby from an affair that they had to hide from Boan's husband. So, Dagda set about dealing with this. The thing was, this child was the most gorgeous child you've ever seen. This child absolutely emanated radiant love from the very core of its being. Everybody who set their eyes on this child fell instantly in love with the child and the child would fill any given room that it was in, completely filled with love. The hearts of people in the room would be enriched just from being around this child. So it was a hard child to give up, but the dagger had to do this. So an idea came to him that he would give this child to Madir and Fumnot, who ran the kingdom of Brilay because these people had, at any given time, they had 150 foster children going on to look after. Because fostering was a big thing once the two day down and people, it was kind of this mechanism whereby tribal warfare was reduced because you'd be less inclined to go and murder all your neighbors if they were looking after your kids for you. So Madeira and Fumnot had 150 kids going on at any given time, so Dagda figured that they probably wouldn't mind taking on one more. And when they saw this beautiful child, Angus Og, this god of love, they entirely fell in love with him, because how could you not fall in love with the Babog that was the god of love? And they took him into their home gladly, and they took him right into their hearts. And this child just emanated the love throughout the kingdom of Relay. And Madir and Fumnot were so happy to have him. Madir 
was a very proud man. They called him Madeir the Proud. He was a big, gregarious sort of, a bit kind of loud, but like in a good-natured kind of a way. And people liked him because he was an essentially good-natured person. Funot was a magical woman. She was the daughter of a powerful druid. And she had a rowan wand, and you'd be in trouble if she ever took it out and pointed it against you. Now, eventually, this baby, Angus Og, grew up. And it was time for him to leave Bree Laves, time for him to leave Madeir and Fumlock's home and their care. And they were so sad to see him go, but he went off to find his own fortune and to go live in the, in the Boyne Valley in Bruna Boynea. Till one day, he got a letter from his foster father, Madeir. And this letter simply just said that Madeir was going to come to Bruna Boynea for a visit, that he missed them. And Angus was perfectly happy to hear this. He was delighted to hear that his foster father was going to come over. He missed him too. And so they met up in the Voyne Valley and they went to see a game of hurling to catch up, find out how everything was with each other. Now, during this game of hurling, it was a scrappy kind of affair, you know, those, those hurling matches where everybody's just sort of pulling and dragging and at each other. It was one of those. And Madeir was getting a bit frustrated watching this. And when a particular scrap broke out on the field Madeir decided to involve himself as people from the sidelines sometimes will do and he went running in there and he caught a stray hurl right to the eye and he emerged bleeding and howling because the right eye had been taken right out of his head this is more of a problem for Madeir than it would be for most people because Madeir was a king and there was a stipulation that all kings had to be physically perfect in order to hold their position. So he had just lost that, but Angus leapt to it. He had a solution. He brought Dean Kecht, the magical physician of the two a Danon, to come and attend to his foster father. And Dean Kecht was able to restore that eye in its entirety, have it completely functioning and intact again. However, it seemed as though Madeir wasn't quite the same person. That good-natured, gregarious nature that he had by him, it was like something was a little changed. It was like something was a little off, like he'd lost something when he lost his eye, in spite of it having been re restored to him. And he became very demanding all of a sudden. He seemed, to, he seemed to be emanating this feeling as though his foster son, Angus, owed him something. And he came to him one day, and he said, I want a new pair of horses, the Pulmy Chariot. And Angus thought, okay, well, I can have that arranged. And he went and he got him a finest pair of horses that he could get. And then Madeira said, yeah, well, now I want a new chariot for the horses to pull. And Angus thought that was a little bit much, but okay. And he went and he sorted out the chariot for his foster father. He felt a little bad about the whole incident with the eye and stuff, even though it wasn't really his fault. And then on the third day, Madeira said to him, I want the most beautiful woman in Ireland. Just cause. And Angus said, okay, that's weird. But he said he'd oblige. And he went scouring the entirety of the land of Ireland through all the provinces, looking for the most beautiful woman in Ireland until he found her up in Ulster and told her about the whole deal, about how he was being a wingman for his foster father. And would you mind coming down to meet him? And she told him that this foster father was, in fact, Madeira de Proud, the king of Brilay. This young lady, whose name was Atain, she had beautiful fair hair and she was indeed the most beautiful woman that Angus Oak had ever laid his lies on. He decided that she would, in fact, come with him to Bruna Boynea and meet Madeira. And when they got to Angus Oak's house, Madeira and Atain, they fell instantly in lust with each other and began just carrying on and just kind of like shifting in public and like just making everybody feel really really uncomfortable and just generally being a bit gross and awful and the reason why people don't want to you know be around couples sometimes and this and angus thought this is a bit terrible i don't like having this in my home at all i feel very awkward all the time but you know he's going to go home back to film not soon he'll 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 realize realize there are those ways and he'll be out of my hair but this time just seemed to drag on and on for months and months Madeir and Atain were there in Angus Hogue's home just being gross and being awful until an entire year had passed and eventually Angus approached his foster father and urged him to go home and he did he packed up his stuff and his new horse and his chariot and he headed off back towards Brie Lay taken 
his new girlfriend with him. Now, his wife, she'd been getting a little impatient, wondering what the crack was, wondering where her husband was, why she'd been left to run a kingdom all by herself, while she'd been left with 150 foster children to rear all by herself, and she wasn't in the best of moods. One day she saw the silhouette of her husband coming over from over a hill from the kingdom and she thought, right, well, we're going to have words and everything, but I'm glad that he's back. But there was somebody with him. It was this young one coming along. And she thought, surely no, surely not. He hasn't spoken to me. He hasn't addressed this to me because at the time there was... There, there, there was provision for people to have multiple partners, multiple wives. However, you don't just, you, you wouldn't just rock up with your new, new girlfriend. This was a whole thing that had to be negotiated. This was, you, and you had to figure out particularly who essentially the main wife was, the main mop. This hadn't been done. And Fumnox, feeling her main motness being threatened, wasn't in a good mood and she decided to break out her own stick wand and once this young one came traipsing into her hallway and sat down on her throne that wand came straight out and was pointed at Etain and Etain was turned into a puddle the puddle soon dried up and left there was a little manky kind of insect egg situation from that grew purple fly and this fly was absolutely massive it was the size of a man's head and very very luminescently purple it was also an absolutely charming absolutely gorgeous absolutely lovely fly that Madeir became very very fond of he seemed to be more fond of the fly version of his young girlfriend than the human version because this fly was amazing it would fly around the place and this beautiful music would emit itself from the fly's wings and this beautiful scent like lavender would come from its purple body and Madeir was absolutely besotted with this gorgeous musical magical fly and poor old Fumnox who had been pissed off before when it was a young one that was replacing her and throwing her off her throne well, got a whole lot more pissed off because all of, all of a sudden she was second place to a big manky purple fly and she wasn't happy and so she broke out that rowan wand one more time and she pointed it at the fly and she conjured from deep within her magical person a great storm and that storm rumbled and it shook the whole kingdom of Brelay and a wind rose out of that wand and it took that fly and sent it flying out the window through the ages, through the mists of time for centuries and centuries this big purple fly was flying through the air until eventually that storm died down and we weren't even in the time of the two of Danon anymore this fly was found itself in a brand new Ireland. The Celts had arrived, a brand new piece, race of non-magical people. And this fly was blown in, the last gust of that wind of that magical storm was blown into a king's courtyard and landed tired and bleary at the edge of a queen's cup. And the queen, not noticing the fly, picked up that cup of wine and drank it down. And then turned to her husband, the king, and said, "Husband." I am with child now. And the husband said, what? <laughs> she said, I think I just drank a fly, so I'm with child now. It will be a girl child, and we shall call her Etain. I don't know why, we should call her Etain. And the husband said, are you sure that's how that works? And she said, she was quite sure, yes. And she must have been right, because her belly started to grow. And nine months later, she gave birth to a child. And it was a beautiful, fair-haired girl child, like she had predicted. And the king said, spot on. I'll never doubt you again. <laughs> and this child grew up into a beautiful, fair-haired lady. The most beautiful lady in the land, because of course it was the exact same shape, the exact same figure as Medain, Med Med of Etain even, of the two of the times. But she had no memory of her former self. She had no memory of her love with, with Madeir, and she had no memory of how she had come here to this new time. But anyway, the High King of Ireland scouted her out, thought she was a fine looking young one, decided to marry her, and she became, she moved to the Hall of Tara to be his wife. And it was all fine, there wasn't much chemistry between them, but it was all fine, it was a good arrangement, he was the High King after all. Until one day, 
devoted stranger arrived in the Hall of Tara, and he challenged the king to a game of chess in this loud, belligerent fashion. And the guards were just about to kick this man out. But the king, his dignity and his pride being a little bit pricked by this devoted uh, stranger, decided that he would take him on in a game of chess, because the king kind of quite fancied himself as a chess player. And he took on the stranger, and the king absolutely annihilated the stranger in the first match of chess. So the stranger demanded another match, and the king absolutely destroyed him in the second match as well. And then the king felt very confident indeed. And the king said, tell you what, we'll do one more match, and this time, if you win, you can have any favour that you like of me. So confident was he in his abilities. And the stranger agreed to this, and then the stranger absolutely annihilated the king in the third game of chess, because he had, of course, been hustling them all along. Watch out for hustlers. And the king said, Okay, man of my word, what favour do you ask of me? And the stranger said, I'd like to kiss your wife. And the king said, no, that's not okay. <laughs> but a promise is a promise. And the king had to make good on his promise. So the king, through gritted teeth, asked the stranger for a month's grace just to get his head around the idea. And the stranger left obligingly. A month later, the Hall of Tara was armed to the teeth. The king didn't get his head around the idea. He wasn't cool with it. He didn't want this hooded stranger coming and kissing his wife. So he enlisted the help of his entire army and got every point the Hall of Tara guarded against this stranger. However, dear, Atain was just sitting in the hallway and she watched the stranger emerge from a shadow as if by magic, but magic wasn't a real thing anymore. They'd heard stories of magic from the two of Daydanon times, but nobody believed that stuff anymore. And yet, there was this real sense of magic when this stranger came walking right over to Atain, and when he pulled down his hood, the man almost looked familiar when he reached out and grabbed her by the hand. All of a sudden, the light of the mortals, of the gods of the two of Danon, was emanating and spilling out from their hand. And she looked in the stranger's eyes and she remembered everything. She recognized them. It was Madeira the Proud her love of times gone by. She remembered the storm. She remembered being a fly. She remembered full knot. She remembered it all. She remembered who she was. She was, she was a tame, the most beautiful woman in Ireland in the time of the two a day Danon. And she looked into her lover's eyes and this light continued spilling out and they began to lift up off the ground and they only had eyes for each other. And the people all around them looked on as the light became so dazzling, so bright. I think until they couldn't see them anymore and when that light was gone Madeir and Atain were gone too and they lived happily ever after almost <laughs> See, I heard another ending to that story You see, I heard that Bucky Aram went digging every single fairy tree up. He went looking for a way into the other world. He was not happy by, by this way to, to be left all on his own. And so he went looking for a way to find Nadir and there was no way into the other world. And so after a year and a day went by and he was all on his own, a winter came back around, Nadir appeared to him. And he said, all right, you've been looking for a way into the other world. I'll, I'll give you a chance to win back your attain. And he led him into a great, beautiful hall. There was 50 women, all looked the same. Each one of them could have been attain. And he said, if you trust your true love's sight, your attain out of all of these women. Bucky Aram was full, sure and confident that he would know his true love and he went up to every one of them, looked them in their eyes till he came to the one he knew he had a connection with like no other. And he stared at her eyes and he knew this was his attain. Medir allowed them leave 
and for a year and a day they were happy in each other's company she became pregnant she gave birth on the day she gave birth to Mess Bukla, a woman who herself would grow up to be the mother of a king, Connor Moore, but that's another story for another time. This day, the day of Mess Bukla's birth, Medir arrived, stepping outside of a shaft of sunlight, and he said, you know how time moves differently in the other world. Well, when I brought a tane away. She was pregnant with your child. She grew up in about a year of your time to look astonishingly like your wife. And in that whole 50 women, the woman you chose was not your thing. It was in fact your daughter who is the mother of your daughter and granddaughter. <laughs> anyway, you really should never trust true love's first instinct, and you should never, ever trust the love. you enjoyed that uh, we don't always end that story the way we did in the live show that time in fact we often play it by ear deciding whether or not to leave the story in a romantic uplifting sense or bring the darker side into it and I often well think that the light and the dark are both equal in parts in these stories you can't shy away from the darkness and the misery and the trauma while also leaving lots of room for the love and the light and the loveliness of these stories as well and so one really comes hand in hand with the other in Irish mythology as you will find when we tell these stories and when you listen to most ballads or love stories love songs and sonnets you'll find something that's heartachingly beautiful as well as tragic at the same time this story is certainly has a very dark undertone and I guess well like I said we often leave it out it's, it's left out of a lot of the reinterpretations and retellings of it most Medir and Atain, uh, versions won't include the incest ending it's easier not to and we off, we've left it out as well I guess I'm very curious to hear from you guys uh, to hear if you have anything uh, to, this, to say. I must have a crack at telling this story because I prefer personally leaving it out even though I was the one in this recording who jumped on in. Uh, for those of you who are wondering where Surak is, well, <laughs> Surak is in making tea uh, and more bread. Uh, she, we, today, although this is probably going to be released a little bit afterwards today we did our first live stream and uh, we're just gearing up for some admin and, and focusing and uh, trying to organise ourselves for what we're doing uh, so we were kind of looking at the structure of an upcoming show and I guess we kind of got a bit burnt out uh, sorry we did it anyway she ran out of words I think she was burnt out from a week of work anyway and uh, she just looked at me and said I can't I don't have it in me. So I'm just giving you a little bit of insight as to where Zurich is and where her head is and she can often not have the words. Anyway, I uh, just wanted to wrap up this without too much talk because I think Medea Natane speaks for itself as one of the most beautiful love stories in Irish mythology and that means it's usually going to end in a bit of darkness because Irish love stories tend to end not the happiest way, I guess. Sometimes they do. Rarely enough. But if you enjoyed it, and if you'd like to support this podcast, you can go to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales. The musicians of the live show last month that you just listened to were Audrey Trainer and Alan Holman, and Rue O'Shea was the storyteller. Like I said, I would love a chance of telling Medea and Nathan myself because I think one of the greatest things we've realised, and one of, as a performer, as an actor, I guess I. I appreciate it so much more 
when I see other actors take over roles, it becomes, you know, everybody will talk about the number of who is their favourite Doctor Who or who played Hamlet, their favourite way. And the interpretation of a character is is huge and you put a different face on it, you put a different voice on it and the lines might remain the same but something essential is very, very different of course. And when stories are retold, recreated and shared, obviously the teller makes it their own and you lean on certain aspects of this story that are, are different. Rue uh, definitely lent on uh, an interpretation of this story that I think uh, he, when we were talking about it uh, previous to actually uh, telling the story live he was talking about how he had an interpretation from working on the Bard School of Mythology out in Clare Island where a lot of brilliant people gather there every year in July and talk about the depth of wisdom and archetypes and kind of Jungian psychology that are, that can be applied to myths and from that perspective do, delve into uh, some of the meanings and, and other meanings and reinterpretations of, of these myths and they used this story Medea and Tain they looked at them once and it was a romance story initially it was a poetic beautiful po- um, love story and then the character Foom, look, her uh, isolation and her and the betrayal of her marriage and her love for her husband was highlighted in one of their discussions. And I think Rue always felt very loyal and sorry for uh, for Foom, as as I have uh, as well. Um, depending on which which kind of line you want to fall down on, I've uh, interpreted it different ways as well. But I think it's open to the storyteller to lean on certain aspects. So whether you lean on the betrayal and the hurt and the justification for Flumluck to avenge uh, the love that she had with her husband and take it out on Athene or whether you, as I have before, lent on, I guess, a bit of uh, (laughs) uh, admiration for uh, the purity of the love that is felt between Medea and Athene, I think. That's something that I've certainly felt something, uh, some form of a draw towards, uh, making kind of romantic. I think everyone does, because, oh, that's the pure love. But that's also the the lust and the longing and the, and the flightiness of love as well. So anyway, um, that was my two cents on Medea and Athene. If you'd like to hear more, well, drop us a line. Uh, we got a request for Diamond and Grania, so we'll be telling that story very soon as well. And, well, if you want to hear more stories, there's a catalogue there of podcasts. Listen away, guys. Let us know if you're listening and um, let us know if you have any requests as well. Keep it lit, lads. Thank you very much. Tune in next time.